I think California is going to be a lot of fun. It'll be warm and sunny. I'll buy a lot of stupid souvenirs and eat weird food and take a lot of interesting photographs. I'll take a journal so that I can remember later what I've seen. December 26th. The flight is pretty routine. No sudden drop out of the sky, no hijacking. The in-flight movie is Dragnet, the movie. A delicious lunch. It is mid-afternoon when we land in Los Angeles. It looks exactly like I hoped it would, like a cartoon. Weird curving buildings, wide open sky, palm trees everywhere. A funky black taxi driver, I hate to say funky, but that's what he was, takes us to where we're staying, just in front of the Hollywood Hills, with Harry and Claire. Dad and Claire grew up together in central Manitoba. Fletcher, Claire's brother, was Dad's best friend. Harry and Claire seem like nice people, a bit strange, really laid back. Harry grew up in Hawaii, although you would never guess this by looking at him. He is really into UCLA football. He keeps a basket of Playboys in the bathroom. They take us to a Mexican restaurant near their house for dinner. It's called El Coyote and is really cool. Dark, noisy, deep red. Claire orders for everyone. We have amazing guacamole and Mexican beer in clear bottles. I'm really tired, but it's been a good day. December 27th. Mostly a lot of driving today. The freeways go forever. The city is huge. Claire takes us to Universal Studios for the tour. King Kong shakes our train, and we're attacked by some freaks from Battlestar Galactica. The other tourists on our train look like freaks, too. Claire picks us up and takes us to a place called the Sportsman's Lounge, where we're going to have dinner with a bunch of her relatives. I was disappointed at first, because I wanted to go somewhere interesting and trendy, but the Sportsman's Lounge turns out to be great. The maitre d' has silver hair and a sequin bow tie, and I sit across from Gary and Greg, who are twins my age. They keep grinning. Gary says he works for Kodak, so I'm thinking, oh, one of those photo booths in a parking lot. But he works in Silicon Valley as an engineer, coding floppy disks with Teflon. And Greg is in Econ at UC Santa Barbara and is on the surfing team. They tell me they'll show me a good time if I ever come back to California. Everybody asks me how I'm doing and how I like California so far. The whole thing makes me feel good, like I'm family, like I've been made honorary cousin. December 28th. Claire drives us to Venice Beach. It is covered with freaks, all camped out in tents, bikers, hippies, drug addicts. We eat lunch further down the beach in Marina del Rey at this Captain Jack place. I have a seafood cob, which is a huge mound of shredded crab on some lettuce. On the drive back, we pass about 100 Denny's signs. I want to go into a Denny's. We stop at a supermarket near the house, and I see my first real American grotesque, a fat woman with false eyelashes and a huge double chin and eye makeup and long natural fingernails the color of sour milk. I am satisfied. This evening I meet Suzanne, Claire and Harry's daughter. I went upstairs to wash my hands for dinner, and when I came out of the bathroom, she was standing in the hall. She looks really old for her age, which I guess must be about 30. She has wrinkles at the corners of her mouth and lines on her forehead, and her features are pinched and sharp. She's wearing typical would-be artist clothing, short black boots, black tights, black miniskirt, and a long, dingy yellow sweater. For some reason, this sad sympathy comes over me, because I have the feeling that she can't see herself. She starts to brush her hair, and I think I'm making her nervous because she does it really quickly. I stand around awkwardly, making some polite remark like, uh, so you're an artist. She mumbles, disclaiming herself, and I say something about being in school. We're both glad to end it there. At dinner, Suzanne sits beside Claire, and it's obvious that she's only eating with us as a favor to her parents, because she doesn't seem to want to be with other people. 
First, we have a glass of tomato juice, and then Suzanne and Claire go into the kitchen to bring out the food. During dinner, Suzanne hunches over her plate, and Claire leans over every now and then to say something quietly to her, to involve her in the conversation. Claire divides her time between Suzanne and laughing at the incredible stories Harry is telling. First, he tells a story about picking up two 14-year-old hookers in Hollywood, both of them high as kites, and driving them out to the Playboy Mansion, where Mr. Hefner himself came out and got the girls and gave Harry a big tip. He tells us that Jack Ritter is his good friend because he's always getting in Harry's cab. And once he drove Bill Cosby in from the airport, and then when Harry was in Las Vegas, Bill remembered him and they played tennis together. Claire is screeching with laughter, and I don't know whether this means we should believe these stories or not. At that end of the table, Dad, Mom, and Melanie are laughing too. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Suzanne. Every now and then, she looks up and smiles, and then looks at the table again. She's pretty quiet without any of Claire's attention, and no one but me seems to notice her. Harry's on to talking about his childhood in Hawaii now, how they could walk to school barefoot and pick fruit off the trees on the way home, how they had to get out after Pearl. Pearl is his name for Pearl Harbor. Dad makes a link from this to his growing up in Manitoba stories, so I stop listening, having heard all of them a hundred times. Claire knows them too, or different versions of the same stories, so she quiets down a little. I watch Suzanne eating. She eats a few beans and a few slices of potato and puts the rest of her piece of chicken on Claire's plate. They whisper together about it. When she puts her fork down and starts playing with her hair, she looks like a little girl, which is a funny thing to think because earlier she looked so old. I watch her closely, the way she plays with her hair. I notice now that the color of her hair is maroon, but that it looks good. She gathers a handful, pulls it around the back of her neck, spills it onto her shoulder, and combs her fingers through the kinks. She does this over and over. I like watching this. I watch her lips. They are thin and firm. She has big hazel eyes, and she lets her eyelids hang half closed. I stare at her. The more I look at her face, the more it seems precise and perfect. This makes me feel coy and self-conscious. I keep butting into the conversation to say witty things that I think will impress her and get her to look up. When she does, she smiles weakly, and I feel sort of silly. After dinner, Mum and Dad go off to see Claire's relations in the neighborhood. Melanie goes to her room to read, and Harry goes to the bathroom. So Suzanne and I are left at the table. She doesn't get up and leave, which surprises me. I start talking about her art. She says she can't decide between photography and commercial art, that she does a little of both, but not enough to call herself an artist either way. I give her my opinion on it, and my opinion on things that I don't know about, like business and politics and culture. My voice doesn't sound funny, and I'm not afraid I might say something stupid. We talk about the real world, about having a job, working for a wage. She has a job in a candy store. For the first few days, she says, she didn't like it. She kept asking herself, why am I getting chocolates for people? Why don't they get their own? But then she calmed down a little, she says. And now she kind of likes designing the plates of chocolates they display in the window, because that's sort of artistic, and she likes weighing the chocolates. I know this feeling. I know exactly what she means when she says weighing the chocolates. She's leaning on her elbow talking and smiling every now and then. And all this time, I'm looking at her face, and the lines at the corner of her mouth, thinking that she is actually beautiful. Somehow I am here with this beautiful woman, and I feel older. When she talks or smiles, I watch her mouth. She is beautiful. I ask her questions about Los Angeles. She says what I'm sure I would say. She likes the city in some ways, but it is too big. She is lost in it. I go into great depth about my feelings about the places I have lived in. This seems particularly important to say now. I tell her about Southern Ontario. That is what she wants to do now, she says. She wants to go somewhere where she can feel comfortable, where she doesn't have to burrow away because of the pressure. There is too much going on in LA for her. Are you thinking of coming up to Canada, I say jokingly, but in the back of my mind, hopeful. Stupid thoughts are running through my head. She will come to Toronto, or I will stay here. Harry comes in, and she goes back to being his daughter, but I know she's just pretending for his sake, just covering up what was going on. She draws back from him, and when she talks, she just asks questions in a small voice. 
Harry tells us that his first job in L.A. was patrolling a Navy yard, and one night he and his partner found two guys in the yard, so they chased them, and Harry shot one guy's foot off, just left it there, and his partner killed the other one. My head is still spinning from talking to Suzanne, so I just look at Harry and nod. When I think about her later, none of it will settle in my mind. Are you thinking of coming up to Canada, I said. Well, she said, smiling that shy smile. Well, she said, as if she might. I smiled too. Stupid thoughts run through my head. She will come with me or I will stay here. I will stay with her in the middle of the city or we will go away. Her career will get going. I can't name it, but that doesn't matter. It seemed real and secure. January 2nd, still driving. We have stopped talking. We get to Monterey, John Steinbeck's place. Total disappointment. It's all touristy and dull. Where the hell do you have to go to find the places you read about? Cannery Row is just restaurants. All we see in the rain is a soggy beach with a live bait shack. Of course, there is a Denny's in the center of town. As we drive north, the landscape is kind of relaxing. Out one window, smooth brown hills, and out the other, green fields that stretch out forever. I can't remember what Suzanne looked like. I know, beautiful, but I can't make this word do anything in terms of a picture. Every now and then, there is a sign sticking up indiscriminately. We passed a broken down trailer park, just four or five old trailers stopped together, and there was a sign on a pole that said, sale. Sale what? What's on sale? What kind of sale could they be having? We spend the night in a motel at the side of the highway. January 3rd. We keep driving north, bypassing San Francisco, to a place called Yuba City to visit Fletcher, Claire's brother. He was dad's best friend once. The countryside around here is all cut up into lines. If you catch a plowed rut in your line of vision, you can see all the way down it to the bottom of the sky. Rows and rows of grafted trees fan out past the windows. There is even kiwi growing. This landscape is absurd. I can't really remember what it felt like being excited about Suzanne. I go back in my journal reading the notes and seeing it all described, but nothing really happens. When we get to the house, a fat man opens the door. He has brown spots all over his head and a ring of white hair. His voice is thick with cigarette tar. He looks about 20 years older than Dad. Dad acts like nothing is wrong. There is a framed map of Manitoba and Saskatchewan in the living room. It is a very good map, as if he uses it. On the way back to San Francisco, I'm in the back seat, listening to Melanie's Walkman, and I can see the green glow of the dashboard in the dark. There is no feeling more like home than the dashboard dials glowing on a long, dark drive, and you're slumping down in the back seat, starting to feel sleepy. A San Francisco radio station has a Led Zeppelin show on, and I get a small rush of nostalgia about Led Zeppelin. Once on a holiday up north, I remember it was dark, it was night, and I woke up having an asthma attack. Mum and Dad were up, and they weren't worried about it. I thought they wouldn't help me. I think we were in a rented cabin. January 4th. We're staying at a Holiday Inn. I hate it. After we get up, we all yell at each other for a while, which I knew was coming, and then we go downtown. I can't remember what I should want to see besides that funny pyramid building, or is that somewhere else? There are the hills, of course, but I never thought they'd be so high and so hard to walk up.
January 5th, our last day in San Francisco. I debate mailing some postcards, but I figure what's the point? We get a taxi to rush us around all the rest of the sites. We go across the Golden Gate Bridge. This morning in the paper, it said somebody had jumped yesterday and lived. As we cross, I try to see down to see what 228 feet looks like. I feel sort of cheated that someone jumped while I was here and it didn't actually kill them. Maybe if they'd done it, it would have been worth sending a postcard. We fly home. February 11th. Steve and I sit around an all-night donut shop, and I tell him different stories of the trip. I'm trying to sort it all out. A metaphor occurs to me. It was like watching fence posts on the highway. If you just see them go by the window, they're a blur, because they're moving by so fast. But if you fix your vision on one and turn your head with it, you can freeze it, isolate it, but only for a moment, because you can only concentrate that hard for so long before you have to let it slip back again and leave it there because you're moving forward to some destination.